Good evening, all. Welcome back to Introduction to Philosophy. Tonight, we are talking about William James's pragmatism and also the philosophy and life of Ludwig Wittgenstein. So with James, we got to start with some isms. We're moving from his radical empiricism to his pragmatism and pluralism. Um, and really, to do that, we've got to start with his functionalism. In his Principles of Psychology, is a functionalist psychology and kind of forms the foundation where for what would become known as American behaviorism. So he takes the position that all those things of nature, by means of evolution, we've been fit to deal with the environment in which we find ourselves. Now, how does that work? For instance, he's going to ask a very important question. Does consciousness exist? And the answer he gives us is yes and no. If we think about consciousness as kind of immaterial, spaceless, massless, but ontologically real, then no, that doesn't exist. But if we think of it as a flow of ideas, that kind of stream of perceptions and thoughts and feelings, uh, the process by which intelligence knits together experiences over the course of time, then yeah, consciousness absolutely exists. So without going to kind of the final causes of Aristotle or attaching himself to Darwin, what James gives is a way that we're going to tie processes to functions. Uh, so like, what is the function of consciousness? What is it for? What does it get us that we could not get in any other way? Now we know the brain is a really complex, cool organism. It's got millions of cells that are always working. And yet it's not just this buzzing, blooming confusion. We do have some control over it. For survival, not only do we have to be able to sense the environment outside of us, but we've got to be able to subtly re react to it. Uh, that's that kind of hair trigger nature of brain function, okay? Our conscious processes, um, specifically our conscious functions are things like attention, selection, and will. And it's out of the experience that the will itself gets constructed. That's James, what he calls the ideal motor theory of growth, okay? It's reflexive control at first. We just reflex to it as the infant might respond to some kind of stimuli. Those reflexive experiences though, they continue and they persist and they form this reservoir of behavior that we can then draw on as individuals. If we look at all the possibilities around us, we're able to select one behavior over another from the reservoir that we've accumulated. Pretty straightforward. So for James, the will is just a part of our nature, uh, as it must be if we're going to live and live successfully. Now his pragmatism ties to his functionalism. How? Well, critics of pragmatism usually take it to be, if it works, then it's true. I mean, that understanding, there wouldn't be any way to kind of distinguish between competing scientific worldviews if both led to reasonable practical success. That sort of short changes James's version of pragmatism and that of uh, Charles Sanders Bierce, whom he was not always happily associated with. James said basically the pragmatic method is a method of settling metaphysical disputes that might be otherwise totally interminable by trying to trace each one to what its consequences were. Uh, so, for instance, a metaphysical dispute might be, does God exist? Or does such a thing as good exist? And we can kind of trace it down as well. What are the consequences this way or that way? Okay. So, Pierce had early formed a different version of pragmatism. He said, consider what effects, which might conceivably have practical bearings, we conceive the object of our conception to have. So, what effects does God have? What effects does the good have? then the whole conception of those effects is the whole of our conception of those objects. We lump all those things together, either as God or as good or whatever it is we happen to be talking about. The views are similar but different. Uh, Pierce called his, his position pragmatistic, James being pragmatism. Does it matter to us? Not particularly. What they have in common is the standard that we want to apply here. Pragmatism on James' account matches up with our notion of interest. What we do, we do in behalf of our highest interests. So what are our highest interests? Aren't they different for different people at different times and in different cultures? Uh, for instance, what we view as beautiful. Uh, think of the Padong women of Burma that add the brass rings to their collars, uh, to their necks, to elongate their necks. They don't actually do that. They just press their collarbones down. Or the Ubangi tribe of Africa that inserts huge plates into their upper and lower lips as a mark of beauty. Okay, how do we reconcile that with it? I mean, for all we know, the universe is evolving in such a way uh, that we really can't accept a block universe, some static mass about which is there is the last word, and that's true for all time. As we find ourselves in different contexts, there's always another broad perspective that replaces an earlier one. Now, whether you want to go from a flat Earth theory to a round Earth theory or whatever, it's going to be replaced gradually. 
Uh, you can take physics up only to a certain point beyond which you need calculus to solve certain physics problems. And there's a perspective that isn't everywhere going to be the same. Uh, if you look at the fashion of a major metropolitan area and then you go 100 miles outside of that town to a more rural area, it's probably going to be delayed six months, a year, maybe more. Okay? In their given context and for lives actually lived, certain beliefs and attitudes directly fortify, they give direction to those lives. And there really isn't a unifying theory that replaces that diversity of outlooks because that would presuppose a uniformity that we simply don't have. So James says, our highest interests are not tied to our culture considered apart from all others. We really can't enforce our habits and practices on others, but we can discuss our natures and what the nature of our highest nature might look like. If we don't have any other interests in common, we really can't blame moral uh, we really can't bring moral claims against people that we see to be bad or evil, like the Nazis or KKK or Al Qaeda as whatever. Okay? So James as a pluralist isn't a relativist. He's not saying, well, it's okay for them, but not for us of the modern strike. He's countering this with fallibilism. Okay? There's always more than one account that a current version can include because there are other experiences, other beliefs, other needs that we've got to account for. So what we've got to do is kind of conduct ourselves in such a way as to record what we take to be our highest interests, but we might never know if we've got them exactly right or if we've matched our interests by our actions. There just is no final word. Now, what we've got to accept is what is. Unlike the positivist, James says, look, we've got to accept that there's a religious element to life, even if you don't participate in it because credible reports point to the existence of one. People have religious experiences, as well as striving to perfect ourselves that go beyond individual souls and bodies and so on. There are also things that we just simply can't claim to know. A fallibilist doesn't say um, that, or doesn't deny that there's some absolute point of focus, but we're warned to be suspicious of anyone who claims to have the final word on things. If they say they've got all the answers, pretty good indicator that they probably don't. So let's switch over and talk about the, uh, the philosophy of Ludwig Wittgenstein. In his philosophical investigations, Wittgenstein answers the question, what is your aim in philosophy by saying to show the fly the way out of the bottle? So that ought to give you some indication of just kind of how off the deep end this is going to go. Uh, Wittgenstein wrote in very homiletic or what we might call aphoristic ways, kind of saying, hey, you figure out what I mean in this passage. And he changed the way that we understand the problems that make up philosophy. In fact, if he's right, there really aren't any problems of knowledge of conduct and governments. They're just misunderstanding and puzzles, mostly that have to do with our logic, our grammar, and our language. So the only book that was published during his lifetime has a really intimidating title. It's called the Tractatus Logico Philosophicus, uh, usually just called as Tractatus. This was his doctoral dissertation on the problem of knowledge is rooted, he says, in how we describe the world. And so we've got to come up with creative accounts for describing the case at hand. The case at hand has to be part of the world because that's the part that every case occurs. We don't know any exceptions to this. Nothing is going on right now outside the world. Or, pardon me, outside the universe or outside consciousness, etc. So to state the case is to kind of give a proposition. We're giving a picture of reality. It is nice outside right now. Well, it kind of depends on if you agree with me what nice is. High 70s, low 80s, gentle breeze, not too bright. Well, that's nice. Okay, that's a proposition. Now, whether or not you agree with me is kind of up to you. The limits of my language, though, mean the limits of my knowable world. If I can't talk about it, I really can't express it to you either. So how are we going to approach this? The picture theory of meaning is one that Wittgenstein, or Wittgenstein's not going to go along with. So a little bit about him. He's born in Vienna in Austria in the 1880s. He's the youngest of eight children, comes from a wealthy family. Three of his four brothers committed suicide, and he himself uh, really struggled with depression and anxiety. In 1908, he enrolled in an engineering program in England, got into mathematics, and he moves to Cambridge, studies with Bertrand Russell, who if you Google him, you will see is the most English looking person you have ever seen, uh, who's working in mathematical logic serves on the Austrian side in World War I. Remember, contrary to what uh, you learned watching the movie Wonder Woman, the Austrians weren't necessarily the bad guys. There really weren't bad guys in World War I. Uh, and anyway, that's neither here nor there. Finishes up, goes back to Cambridge, writes the Tractatus, and he says, 
this book has solved all of philosophy's non-problems. And so he drops philosophy altogether, takes a position in Austria teaching elementary school. Mic drop. Now, as long as we subscribe to a picture theory of meaning, the only way we can tap into something that someone else knows is through their introspective reports. So for instance, if I asked you to describe your perfect meal, you might be able to walk me through the various courses of that meal, but the closest I'm gonna get is whatever you describe it as. We publicize our knowledge by revealing our pictures to others. So I might say it's a filet mignon, cooked perfectly medium rare, it's got some mushrooms on the side, maybe some cream spinach with lots of Parmesan, some asparagus, we follow it with a sorbet. It's all, of course, served with the right wines. So my knowledge as regards my own mental life is completely private. It's incorrigible. You can't correct it because you're not me. Now, the central claim of science, if we're really following Bacon and Newton, is whatever suitable subject of scientific inquiry is that which is accessible to empirical observation. I got to be able to see it, taste it, touch it, hear it, smell it, and the rest of it. But if what's going on in my mental life, something of which I have complete epistemological control over, and if my mental life is filled up with the facts of the external world, we kind of run into the problem of solipsism. What solipsism is, is that position that I know I'm here because I think therefore I am, but quite frankly, all of you could simply be figments of my imagination and I could do better. Now, the problem of knowledge in this case just kind of becomes the problem of my own unique knowledge of the external world. That's the received view and Wittgenstein says, eh, it's pretty mistaken. And a lot of those mistakes are grammatical. What we have to do is play what he calls the language game. And he illustrates this with the beetle in the box example. Here's kind of how this works. Imagine we're in a room with a half dozen people, each of which his has a small box. No one can see the contents of anyone's box but their own. If I walk around the room and ask everybody what's in their box, each person is gonna respond, beetle. Now Wittgenstein asks a very good question that we probably haven't thought of. If each person had their own private language, how could anyone know the meaning of the word beetle in any language but their own? To carry the example further, imagine you were alone, that it was a solipsistic life, that you were the only thinking being in the cosmos. And now you want to identify the contents of your box. How do you do it? What do you call it? A name signifies something only to the extent that it's understood by those speaking and spoken to as standing for the thing signified. Uh, so if we think of the peace sign or victory or whatever, or we see a circle with a line through it, probably in red, maybe over a cigarette, maybe over a skateboard, we don't know. We know that thing's prohibited. Uh, we see a red octagon with white writing on it. Even if we don't read that language, we know it to stop and so on, but to stand for something, a sign has to be related by that to that thing in some sort of rule or conventional understanding. Well, I mean, this looks like V, I, I get the victory thing, how does this relate to peace? That one I've never quite understood. So all of these sorts of different things, we've kind of got to have some conventional understanding. Literally, we have to come together and figure out what it's going to mean for us. But adopting conventions, that's a social act. Conventions are part of actual practices of people in the world, and you can't play a private rule to a private occurrence. You can't even break the rules of the language game unless you've got other players. So Wittgenstein concludes, our minds are not these black boxes to which we alone have access, whose contents we name for ourselves. How could anyone seeing something in the box know it to be a beetle, whether it's Paul McCartney or whether it's a staghorn beetle, without some kind of prior agreement as to what a beetle is? Now, Thomas Reed had taken this position that if there weren't a natural language, then we could never append onto it an artificial language, okay? A natural language, that's a language of sounds, facial expressions, intonation, posture, things like that, like, you know, things like that. Wittgenstein takes mostly the same position that Reed had prior to this. So the natural language of pain is grimacing, crying, cringing, whatever. It's not something that's learned. Nobody has to pull you aside and be like, hey, look, when you're hurt, please cry, maybe cringe, grimace for us. It's already in place as a natural reaction to that painful sensation. Artificial conventional forms and signs can be grafted onto that. So you might be taught to say, ow, when you're hurt or ouch, I don't know. We use these resources of our natural language to build and reinforce the shared reality that's represented in our artificial language. But where there's meaning, there's gotta be social conventions. There's gotta be social practices. 
there's kind of this discursive history behind every experience that it gains its meaning. Uh, so think of the concept of yeeting something. I mean, it's kind of onomatopoetic. It sounds like what it is. You know, one of my chickens actually only yeeted one of its chicks the other day, and it was kind of funny to watch. But this is an expression that only entered the language in about the last four or five years or so. It begins as a public phenomenon and might be internalized in some way over thereafter. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie Mean Girls, the one girl is trying to introduce fetch as an adjective. That is so fetch. And they say, stop trying to make fetch a thing. So some of these terms catch on while others don't for whatever reason. So the language game is this set of social practices. It's not really reducible to the experiences of any one person, whether it's me, you, or anyone else, and not confined to the area of a private mind. Beetle refers to an object that can be dubbed beetle only by people that have a sufficiently shared form of life. Okay, that thus all of our meanings are socially constructed through whatever practices the community engages in. Philosophy is a search for meaning. It's a search for truth, a search for rules of conduct and so on. It's a social undertaking that kind of proceeds according to grammatical, that is rule governed forms. Okay? So Wittgenstein calls Aristotle. He says our names for ourselves, baker, Christian, father, child, don't inhere in us biologically. Gender, though not necessarily sex, nationality, morality, the authority, creativity to bring about those things, most of this is socially constructed. Wittgenstein offers that once this is understood, that fly might find its way out of the bottle. So the problem of knowledge becomes another part of this language game that he's playing with us, and it becomes a problem of meaning. And what's called for here is kind of a linguistic analysis rather than doing epistemology or metaphysics as we have been doing. Metaphysics itself is built up linguistically. So Wittgenstein says, look, my purpose is not to solve problems, but to show the fly away out of the bottle. That's not going to change the nature of the fly. The fly's probably still going to be a fly. The fly's probably going to go into some other bottle, very likely. What he says in his philosophical investigations is this. And we think of the tools as a toolbox. We've got a hammer, we've got a pliers, so we've got a saw, a screwdriver, a ruler, a glue pot, nails, and a screw. The function of these words are as diverse as the functions of those objects. It's easy to imagine a language consisting only of orders and reports in battle. Uh, we're going to be talking about Alan Turing, who invents binary, basically just ones and zeros. A language consisting only of questions and expressions for answering yes and no, which is basically what binary is. And a bunch of others, to imagine a language means to imagine a form of life. So Wittgenstein leaves us with some really good things to consider and um, some things that might keep us up a little bit at night as we try and figure out, well, what does all this mean in relation to us? So that's all I've got for you this evening. As always, if you've got questions, put them down in the comments, put them over on the discussion page, and I'll look forward to seeing you next week. Bye-bye.